All right, starting to slowly, the numbers go up. So we'll go ahead and um, um, get started as folks start dropping in, dropping in. So welcome today. We're really excited here at FFJC to be hosting this webinar today and have this great group of speakers here to talk about the work in Nevada. Um, so just to set the stage a little bit and give everyone a sense of, you know, what we're going to be talking about, what these issues are. Um, in 12 states, minor traffic violations such as speeding and driving with a broken taillight are criminal infractions. Individuals can be arrested and even incarcerated for these violations. And in several states, um, warrants are used to compel people to pay their fines and fees. And in 2021, Nevada became the first state to decriminalize traffic in 30 years. And while ending the use of warrants for un uh, and while ending the use of warrants for unpaid court debt. And today we are uh, really fortunate to have a few of the members of the coalition that have worked on this issue in Nevada here to talk to us about how they did that work. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, just a few housekeeping things for today. The chat function is not on. And so if you have questions, we're gonna have Q and A. Um, please put them in the Q and A box. That is a separate function from the chat function in Zoom. We're really hoping for this to be conversational. And so as you're putting questions in, I want to try to ask them in real time um, and have the conversation go where folks want it to go and answer questions as we want them to go. So I'll try to incorporate them um, where they make sense. And then uh, this, this webinar is being recorded. And so we will have it available for people who are, have to jump off or are not able to attend uh, today. And so that we can share this information widely. So today we're joined uh, by assembly member Rochelle Wynn, um, Felicia, Felicia Mosley, Felicia Mosley, <laughs> Lisa Mosley, and Nick Shifak from the Fines and Fees Justice Center um, Nevada State Team. And although Nick is now with the Fines and Fees Justice Center, he actually was with the ACLU of Nevada when they were doing this work um, this past session, and now he is a member of the FFJC team. So we're very happy to have him. And we also are joined by Mark, uh, Marcos Lopez, who is the Community Engagement Director for AFP Texas, but was formerly with AFP in Nevada as well, um, who will be able to speak to us about the role the AFP played in the coalition and the work in Nevada. <clears throat> Across the country, there are a wide range of low level things that are criminalized, loitering, vagrancy, homelessness, jumping turnstiles, and in 12 states, uh, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Alabama, Kansas, Georgia, Indiana, Tennessee, Wyoming, Mississippi, Utah, and Maryland, low-level driving offenses, ones, people, ones that people get every day are criminal. A ticket for something as minor as driving with expired registration, driving without your license, or not having proof of insurance in the vehicle can lead someone to, can land someone in jail if they are unable to afford the fines and fees. This was also the case in Nevada up until this year. Between July 2017 and July, June 2019, over 38,000 Nevadans were, had their driver's licenses suspended because they couldn't afford to pay court fines and fees. Nevada's justice and municipal courts have issued hundreds of thousands of arrest warrants over the years. When the pandemic forced the courts to close in March last year, 270,000 traffic warrants were outstanding in L Las Vegas justice courts alone. And in 2018, 31.8% of Nevada residents had incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level. And these income issues cross into racial lines as Nevada is in the top 10 states with racial economic disparities. And how those disparities come ahead with these issues we will be talking about um, might be most best illustrated with the point, this point in Las Vegas, that two thirds of their traffic warrants stem, stemming from unpaid traffic tickets were from majority black and Latin, Latinx zip codes. Black people who the data shows are more likely to be stopped by the police make up 13% of Clark County's population, but were issued 43% of the warrants. The advocates and policymakers in Nevada accomplished the work of addressing driver's license suspension, decriminalization of traffic, and ending warrants to two pieces of legislation, AB 116, a bill to decriminalize traffic tickets and stop issuing warrants over unpaid court debt, and SB 219, a bill that ended debt-based driver's license suspensions. So we're going to start with Lisa. Lisa, tell us 
sort of how this work began, when it began, um, when Nevada started thinking about these issues and mo moving towards change. Thank you, Priya. Well, I can tell you, I've been involved in the work um, as far back as 2011. I think that's about the time that we started seeing uh, legislation. We started seeing efforts legislatively to end the practice of using warrants as a collection method for drive, outstanding driving uh, violations, outstanding tickets related to driving. As you all know, th th we tried this four different times before we finally were successful this past legislative session. Um, I got involved largely because of my own experience with traffic tickets and warrants and actually being arrested with my children in the car after being pulled over. And the ticket was for something, it was for driving with an expired registration. And so that was um, several years ago. So there had been efforts. We've had several legislatures that have tried this before. And I think part of the reason we weren't able to be successful is we just didn't have a, as much community input and a lot of support that way. And one of the things that I started doing is talking to other people about my experience, sharing my experiences. And as I did that, I started hearing from so many other people that they were experiencing the same thing. And so I'm a member of the Clark County Black Caucus, which is an advocacy organization that advocates for policy that uplifts the Black community and other minority communities. So I took this to our board and said, this is happening. And because of the kind of work that we did around policy, we were able to just start talking about that within our, in our caucus. But we also decided that this is an issue that needs to be, have, it needs to have more attention brought to it. And so we started partnering with other organizations like the NAACP, the faith-based organization. And we started hosting town halls. We started hosting um, different events and bringing in, talking with legislators, talking with judges, talking with people who were involved in this and just getting more attention. And as we did that, we found out that so many more communities, so many people were being impacted by this. And so we just brought a lot of attention to it that way. And <clears throat> this last session, of course, we partnered with the ACLU, we partnered with Mass Liberation, we partnered with all of these other coalitions. And Nick can speak more to that because there was a whole wonderful coalition of about 30 different organizations that we were a part of that were able, we were able, finally able to get this legislation passed. And much of that credit goes to Assemblywoman Rochelle Wynn, who is happily on, I'm so happy to know that she's with us to talk about that because it had been presented before. And when she got it, she decided that she wanted to run with it. And so that's kind of how we got started here in Las Vegas, in Nevada. Um, Assembly Member Wynn, can you tell us a little bit about when you were first approached with this bill? You know, my understanding is that there was a different version sort of a bill that you were approached with. And then you, you sort of made a decision to make this even more robust than folks were originally hoping to get something passed. So can you tell us a little about, you know, why? Why did you decide to go for more than what potentially folks would have been happy with, happy to have seen in this legislative session? And um, what prompted you to make that decision? And how did you actually achieve that? You know, I, I think what Lisa had said was, you know, whether or not she knows it or not, like it, it was seeing some of the work that she had done, like over the past almost 10 years, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, working with community members. And I think that is just the key is engaging the community, engaging the people that these laws actually affect to be a part of that change um, in making those laws. Um, it, there was some legislation that had been brought in 2019, and we only meet every other year. And it would, it, it would essentially have decriminalized traffic. But at that time, there was a lot of other criminal justice reform that was taking place. And there wasn't really a champion that had the time and the and energy and the passion to be able to do it. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, going into the 2021 session, I wasn't sure how I was going to, what I was going to do with that. Um, and I remember having a meeting, I think it was in October or maybe like, like mid-November of 2020, right after, I think it was right after the election with Ms. Mosley. Um, and she was talking about what other jurisdictions within the state have been trying to do. And I was like, man, if a smaller county or a smaller town like Carson City, Nevada can make steps to like decriminalize, um, 
you know, and criminalize poverty, like in this step, that's something that we should take from and we should do across the state. Um, I knew I had worked with Marcos with Americans for Prosperity before, as well as the ACLU, Mass Liberation and Plan, other, all these other organizations and other previous criminal justice reform um, bills that I had worked on. So I knew that there was like a huge, strong team that was would be there to like fight for it. And I remember we were talking and I think because it had failed four times in the past, um, you know, I, I think the coalition was like, hey, let's just try to not get people arrested on them. Like, let's start there. Um, and I think I just was inspired. I was like, no, this is, needs to end now. We need to end this now. Like it needs to be done in Nevada. We need to catch up with those 30 other states. Um, you know, um, we don't need to be one of the 13 or 12 that are remaining that criminalize poverty. And, um, you know, uh, we just went for it. But I think, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it if there wasn't a strong base out there already established. Um, I think, what I was probably successful is um, I like to have meetings and I like to meet with people because I think it really does make a difference if other people that are involved in the process are engaged in the change. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, we had these data points that I talked about in the beginning um, of framing the issue specifically in your state. How did you all get that data and how was that you know, oftentimes in this work, we want a lot of data, we are unable to get as much data as we ever want to make our points. But, you know, how effective was having the data points? Was it, you know, do you think you could have done it without it? You know, as, as advocates balance what they have available to them in the form of data with some of the things that you've already said, the community voice, the impact, how do you think that that sort of played out together in, in moving some of this work? You know, I don't think you can ever do this kind of work without data. I mean, the first question that some of the legislators had was about who this is affecting and how much money and, you know, all of those different things. But one of the things that kind of started the data off for us was when um, in the 2019 session, as, Ms., um, as Rochelle said, these efforts had been attempted before. But there was an interim study to study the feasibility of making traffic violations civil versus criminal. And our legislature had some data from about 10 different courts around the state. And it was data of like how much money had been assessed in warrants, how much money had been assessed in fees, how many warrants were outstanding. And so I started there looking at that data. And to my surprise, a lot of it was missing. Some of the courts said they didn't have it, they didn't know. And so it was kind of confusing because how how do you not know how much money you're assessing and how much you're collecting, how many warrants? Some of the courts had the data, but some didn't. And so I started there and just went to all of the different courts sent public records requests. Some of some of the courts gave us data, some didn't. But the gem in all of that was we found Carson City. And we were all surprised by Carson City. Carson City is our capital. And because of the efforts in 2019, Carson City basically said they saw the writing on the wall. They knew that eventually traffic violations were going to be decriminalized. And so they started decriminalizing right after our 2019 legislative session. They stopped issuing warrants for outstanding traffic violations. They made it so that people could stay on and stay in the court, even if their case had been turned over to collections, they made it easy for them to be able to get back in the court and pay those fines. They waived fees, they reduced fees. And so we saw that, that data from Carson City and when the data that Carson City was able to produce after their efforts showed incredible success. They reduced and um, they were their collection rate increased by 8.5% when they got rid of warrants. But other cases that had been turned over to collections, 50% of those 50%, they saw 50% increase in collection rates. And so that data was so important to be able to present to the legislature. But we also had some students from UNLV and the School of uh, Sociology that wanted to work with us. And the numbers that you talked about earlier were numbers that they were able to get. And they started working with some of the courts. They just started um, asking for this data and they put together this amazing study that showed some of the data points that you talked about. 
One of the interesting things that I found really most interesting about this is their research showed that the top 10 reasons that people were getting citations that turned into warrants had absolutely nothing to do with driving. They were for things like having it driving with an expired registration, not having your license on your person, driving without proof of insurance, having an unregistered trailer. Those were the things. And so when we were able to show that, um, it just opened people's eyes to say, wait a minute, we've got to do something different about this. And so that data was absolutely important. So I would say for anyone who is think any state that hasn't already done this and is thinking about moving forward, try to get as much of that data as you possibly can. Reach out to the courts to try to find out how much money they're assessing in warrants, how many outstanding warrants that they have, um, how much are they collecting, you know, fees. We were able to get all of that data and it was absolutely crucial in our success in getting this bill passed. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really very interesting too because a lot of what we hear in terms of pushback mm -hmm. is this is about public safety. How will we sort of advance X, Y, and Z? How will we, hold people accountable, but when you really see what it is that's happening in practice, like what are we using the fines and fees for? What are people getting these fines and fees exactly. for? Exactly. Resulting in these consequences. Exactly. It is not about public safety. And so that- It, it that wasn't much about public safety at all. As I said, the top 10 reasons that people were in Warren status had absolutely nothing to do with them being behind the wheel and driving. And so that was important because the belief was that, like you said, this is impacting public safety. If we're issuing warrants and making people pay, it's improving public safety. But we were, the data showed that that was absolutely not the case. And so you're right, that was very, it was eye opening for a lot of us. So, Nick, you know, when you were working on this previously to coming to FFJC, you were with the ACLU of Nevada, and there, that's an organization that has a lot of priorities. There's a lot of issues, you know, the Fines and Fees Justice Center, we work on fines and fees, but in the ACLU, there's a lot of things that um, fall into that under their umbrella. So, there, and there's been so much going on over the past couple of years when we're talking about criminal justice reform, we're talking about policing, we're talking about a lot of very, very important issues, all of which feel like the most pressing issue all the time. So how, can you talk about how within a larger coalition, a larger organization, um, like why was this a priority for a, a, an organization like the ACLU and for other organizations that fell under sort of that larger coalition umbrella that might have other things that are priorities for them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it was an interesting road uh, to make this one of our top priorities when I was at the ACLU. Um, when uh, following, we had a special session in July. Uh, and we tried to address uh, some of the policing in response to George Floyd and the general atmosphere, but there was a promise that we'd come back and deal with policing at the legislature uh, more robustly in the regular session. And, and during that time, uh, we realized that many community uh, organizations were becoming interested in policing, not just those that had traditionally worked in the space, such as uh, the ACLU, the NAACP, the organizations, but but a much broader coalition. So we decided to pull everybody in together. Um, we had traditionally, and uh, you know, to a fault, I would say, uh, as a state, worked kind of as a grass tops where um, organizations that had full time staff would kind of decide what direction we were going to go with legislation. Um, we try to find uh, legislators that were interested, and then we try to bring in community members um, who were who were impacted to help us with the legislation. We tried to decided to flip that on its head, and we said, "Why don't we start by bringing all these communities together, create a coalition? We called it the Justice Reform and Accountability Accountability Alliance, over thirty uh, member organizations and individuals, and we said, let's have those." Uh, let's have those community members lead um, the direction uh, that we want to go. And so we started having these conversations and the idea of this decriminalization of traffic and the ending of the driver's license suspension uh, came across the table. And at first they were like, Nick, do you, do you want to take the lead on this? And uh, honestly, I was like, fines and fees. I do like prison reform and solitary confinement reform. And this is like, uh, fun and in the muck and then but it took 
a, a matter of weeks of receiving the data from Fines and Fees Justice Center from the ACLU National and then talking with these directly impacted community members to realize this issue is one of the broadest and most impactful issues in our state. We have hundreds of thousands of people in foreign status for minor uh, traffic violations. Everybody has either been impacted by the criminal traffic system or knows somebody who has. We have heartbreaking stories of individuals who were pulled away from nursing their children uh, because they were driving without a license trying to get their kids to daycare, uh, things like this. And we realized that not only is this extremely important to the whole state of Nevada, but it's nonpartisan. Our rural communities, our predominantly white rural communities are greatly impacted. Our inner cities in the big cities are impacted. This is something that really everybody can agree on. It's hurting uh, the state collectively. And so it was through those conversations that we decided, you know, this is a real way we want to go. And then a uh, second part to that was overall the coalition decided we needed to do something as much as we can really to stop police interaction with the community. However, we were going to limit that, right? Whether that's through changing the standards of how police operate. Um, but then we realized a lot, the most common interaction between police and the community are really these traffic stops. And when a traffic stop goes into warrant status, that means there's probably going to be an arrest. And those are high tense interactions between law officers and individuals. And those are the biggest opportunities for something to go wrong, as we've seen across the country. And so by addressing this issue of traffic, we're able to really address a larger concern with policing without attacking police, because in the end, they agreed that you know, these warrants were essentially a waste of time, that there was better policing that could be done. So we found an avenue in uh, at a time when there was an appetite by the community for policing, but also a lot of pushback from other from the people on the other side to where we could make a lot of headway uh, into this space and we could get a real consensus around it that also had a great community impact. I think that's a really significant point that you just made there, that doing something like this, where you're decriminalizing traffic, you're removing the warrants from traffic, the actual impact that has with policing and policing contact with the community. And so while we're here primarily today talking about how you decriminalize traffic, we will get into sort of larger discussions about and I think what's important to lift up here for, for folks who are joining or might listen to this that, okay, we already have stopped criminalizing traffic. It's not a criminal um, situation in our state. Is all the places where warrants attach and the criminalization attaches to actions, right? Because that is when we are creating the most opportunity for the police contact that will come from a traffic stop, whether it is civil, uh, a civil ticket or a criminal, um, stop. But if there are warrants in place and there are criminal things in place from even other low level, not public safety related um, situations, that contact is still there and that escalation is still there and all the things that can go wrong are still there, right? And so while we are going to talk about what you all did in this specific area, these concepts really apply across the board of how we look at offenses and our statutes and criminalization and how they all tie together in a lot of the things that we are all Secretary Lee is trying to seek to address through policing, right? And so there are other ways um, in this. And I think we'll get a little bit into how we think about some of this in you know, this very fast changing space of two years ago. Conver the last conversation over the last two years has been very interesting around what people were willing to do, what people were willing to look at. And now we're seeing a media narrative shift on, on things. And I think we should, we should get back to that um, as well. So Marcos, I really wanna you know, talk to you about um, the experience of AFP. So AFP has been, a, uh, Americans for Prosperity, has been a really valuable partner to a lot of this work in many states where folks have been working on fines and fees issues. A lot of the driver's license bills that have passed around the country, AFP has been at the table. They've been a great partner getting those um, bills across the line, spearheading them, leading them with folks. So 
how are, can you speak to how AFP was involved in the work here and how more organizations across the country can work together on these types of issues, even if we don't agree on everything in every space, where we do agree, how we can be better partners together? Oh, definitely. And, you know, criminal justice has been a wonderful issue to work on because I really believe this is the civil liberties, civil rights issue of our time. Uh, when we have the largest prison population in the world, it's a clear signal that something is wrong. And when those uh, populations in prison tend to be low income and racial disparity in its, in its makeup, it's a clear indication that we have serious systemic problems that need to be addressed. Um, and this has to be addressed in a, in a bipartisan, nonpartisan approach. This cannot be left uh, to become a political football that one side just kicks back and forth every single election season, which is why it's extremely important that we have bipartisan buy-in. This is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democrat issue. This has to be a nonpartisan issue where the whole community comes together. The majority of people, for whatever reason they're locked up, are going to re-enter our communities. They're going to come back. Um, it is imperative that we fix everything in the front end and on the back end uh, to make sure we have rehabilitated individuals and that individuals that are going uh, into the system come out uh, and have the potential to have a more successful life, which we know reduces their uh, chances of recidivism. Um, but for anything to do in this general realm to address fines and fees, I think we have about 11 and 12 states left. I think Texas is one of those that we still have to address with. So I look forward to working on that moving forward. Um, you need to have that community buy-in. When we started working on criminal justice reform in Nevada in 2017 at AFP, the first thing we did was go out into the community, figure out who is with us, uh, and try to build a grassroots base around this issue of criminal justice reform so we would be able to collect a warehouse of stories that we would be able to bring to the legislature and bring to the uh, decision makers. And that is extremely important. Numbers and all that, is, it's important as well. But there is no substitute to a story that humanizes the issues and shows the impacts that it's having on everyday Americans. Um, another thing that helps is to have a tremendous sponsor. And there is, that is super important. And the Assembly Woman Nguyen is extremely uh, the epitome of the wonderful sponsor. Um, she has been on this issue for so long. When she first came into the legislature, uh, we started working on AB 236 in the 20s. Uh, 27, 2019 legislature, um, and she was just running with them. There is no substitute for a sponsor that will go to bat for you, a sponsor that's willing to do the legwork and the meeting. It is a lot of work to pass a bill, and it's a lot of work to pass a bill when the incentives that are keeping the system working improperly in place um, are wrong. And that is that is the epitome of, of this, and this is what's going on in a lot of countries. This is uh, in a lot of counties and a lot of states. This has become an issue about money. The courts rely on fines and fees to keep themselves uh, funded. And when you rely on that, the incentives are perverse. They lead to more negative outcomes. And we see this all the time. Um, the other thing that's super important is communication. When you have a large group of the organization of uh, 30 alliance groups coming together, it's important that there is that feedback loop. Everyone has different comparative advantages. We, we have more comparative advantage with generally center right legislators. Uh, the ACLU plan and others have more comparative advantage with center left uh, legislators. But when you need to go talk to them all, everyone needs to know what is happening, what objections are you getting, who's on board, uh, who's holding out for what reason. Um, and that enables us all to be able to move forward with that one common goal, one common vision of what a better state is. And the criminal justice system has so many problems, but whenever we do achieve the success anywhere, we need to do things like this. And that is celebrate these victories and then show others how they can replicate this in their communities. Because uh, there are so many jurisdictions. This is an extremely large country, and this system is affecting millions and millions of people negatively. Um, Priya, I'd like to, to jump in on that. You know, I'm very proud of our state because early on, you know, this has been a bipartisan issue for us here in Nevada. The first two times this legislation was brought forth, it was brought forth by one of our Republican members. And um, one of the things about the Clark County Black Caucus and the um, Fines and Fees Justice Center is the caucus is nonpartisan. So we were always able to work across the aisles and work with legislators on both sides. One of the important things about coalition is I always like to talk about the roles that the different organizations play. Our co coalitions were very diverse, but 
we were able to drum up support for this legislation you know behind the scenes also and that was talking with legislators talking with law enforcement members of law enforcement talking with judges which was a crucial part for us because historically some of the opposition that we've gotten with this legislation has come from law enforcement and from judges and so we the caucus has a really good relationship and um, also finds me justice center really good relationship with judges and so we were able to while the coalition was working out front you know holding different demonstrations and busing people to carson city we were able to work also behind the scenes talking with folks talking with stakeholders and i think that was also a crucial part in getting this legislation passed. I said before that one of the things Assemblywoman Wynn did uh, to a degree that I had not seen done before is she brought in everybody. She talked with not only law enforcement members, she talked with courts, she talked with court administrators. She heard everybody's voice and she brought in everybody who had a stake in this. And she brought in every, and she listened to what everyone's needs were. So as Marcos talked about the courts and the revenue, that was a huge concern for the courts. That was a huge concern for the cities. They were afraid, how, what are we gonna do about this revenue? And one of the things with the data that we were able to show them is the, the revenue that is being assessed is not being collected anyway. And then having that data from Carson City to show how their collection rate actually went up was very, was crucial. So working behind the scenes with different coalitions, um, I mean, within the coalition and also talking with judges and talking to those folks, all of this was a crucial part in getting this legislation passed also. I think one of the things, if I can jump in is one of the things that I, I'm sure all the people, the panelists on here that have worked on other types of policy legislation, one of the biggest things is, is sometimes just implementation, like people just don't like change. <laughs> and this was a significant change. And, you know, you had asked earlier why I wanted a more robust version instead of just like, hey, you can't arrest on traffic warrants anymore. You can't issue warrants. Um, but I guess in my mind, like I saw this as like a greater policy issue. Marcos had pointed out, like when you see systemic like problems, like you have to change the system. And so this, I saw this more as like a big system change. Um, we have jurisdictions that have munis municipal misdemeanor municipal ordinances for that criminalize and carry up to six months for feeding pigeons. So when you have like a crime like that, still on the books that's prosecuted, um, you know, I think having this system change in place allows for you to add some of those other things and make them civil infractions to make them decriminalize those like moving forward. So it's not just about minor traffic, it's setting up a whole entire like system to assess and, you know, um, you know, handle like this change in a more gradual manner. But um, I, I can tell you that it, it is true. It is, you have to personalize it. And it is a nonpartisan issue. And I think sometimes it's good to remind people. I know one of the things that I worked on that really helped push it over is the Clark County District Attorney's Office. Um, I had worked with them. And when they were like, we can support this. And I was like, okay, I'm going for it now. Um, because they recognized that their efforts were best spent you know, prosecuting crime instead of traffic matters. <laughs> so um, I think getting a broad range of people, and there are a lot of different states, um, trucking associations are huge on this, like any of the transportation industry, engaging them, we, we didn't even engage them as much as we possibly could have, um, you know. Um, so for people that are looking to do this in the future, you know, that that is one of the things. And for the people that have already decriminalized, I think looking at some of the other ordinances and statutes that, you know, criminalize non-criminal behavior. I think this, uh, you know, it's easy to, once you have that system in place, to move things into that realm instead of, you know, filling up our jails and prisons. That's really great. Um, so there's a, one question here, um, which is, I'm, I'm curious how you were able to build relationships with judges, and if you have any recommendations for how to do so. So, Michelle, I think you mentioned that, or Lisa may have mentioned that you had a lot of conversations with the courts. <laughs> I know we've worked on relationship building with judges. If you can talk a little bit more about how you did that. And also, I mean, some of the, you know, 
the the, the under the cover things of like it's not always easy right it's not always like they come in and and it's all easy and they agree so when when it's not starting in the same place how do you sort of help to get get folks to the place you're trying to get them so much of my information and answers are going to come from my work with the Clark County Black Caucus, because I was with the caucus for a long time um, before coming on to Fines and Fees Justice Center. And one of the things that the caucus has done since our inception is we do judicial forums. Um, it's gotten really popular now, but we've always understood that judicial races are very important. And who, who is on the bench overseeing these cases is important. Remember, we're the Clark County Black Caucus. And so many of our members, our community members are before judges. So we've always had an interest in, in that. And we built those relationships with those judges then. And so I brought those relationships to, with me when I came on to the Fines and Fees Justice Center and just cultivated those relationships over the years. And so building those relationships, meeting those judges at um, during those judicial forums, and sitting in on courts, we also had a court watcher program. So we would sit in on these courts and we just built these relationships with those judges. And we were able to always get um, conversations going with them about the things that we were working on. And so that's that's how um, I was able to build those relationships. But even in our coalition, you know, the, many of our coalition members also have really great relationships with these judges because of the work that we had done over the years, whether it was criminal justice reform or something else that was impacted by these judges. I, I hope that also, answers the question. I thought I think also engaging some of the easier way if judges are not like accessible um, or they are not getting involved in that is talking with different court administrators. Absolutely. Talking with the staff people that deal with the public on these traffic matters every single day. Um, we met with the clerks that sit at the window that take fines and fees and issue court dates for people on traffic matters. Um, and it was shocking to me because they were really excited to be engaged in the process because they have to actually do the work. <laughs> so it's easy to have a good policy, but if you don't like engage the people that have to implement it, you don't know if you're doing it right. And so I, I remember having a conversation and they were just so grateful. They're like, we've never talked to a legislator about policies that we have to implement. And I was like, that's wild one but two i think that's something that could be taken when people are looking at like strategies about how do i engage them is say hey this is what we're looking to do here's a jurisdiction that does it can you meet with their court administrator to find out what things are and you can often improve on things that they're doing in those other states like you know you'll talk to like arizona and they'll be like we've been doing it this way but we think we you could do it better if we did this it's hard for us to change it but um, you know, on the ground, this is what we need to do. And then you can incorporate that into the policy or the legislation that you pass in your individual states. You know, Rochelle brings up a really good point. And because your first person you usually talk to is in this kind of work is the court administrator. And it was a court administrator in Carson City that gave us the information about how Carson City had implemented their system of not issuing warrants. When we were talking with trying to get some of this data, it was the court administrators. I remember um, Giselle Hernandez here in Las Vegas, the court administrator, who first told us about the 270,000 warrants that the city of Las Vegas had just gotten rid of. And building those relationships with the court administrators. And Nick can talk about this because he, we're, we're working on getting some data now. And he's had some really good conversations with court administrators that have shown us, hey, this is how we've been, this is how we do this. And he has been able to get data that was almost impossible for us to get because we were talking with these court administrators. And what Rochelle said about bringing them in and making them feel like they're needed and hearing their voice because they're the ones that do have to implement this. They're the ones that see this first. So bringing them in and letting us, hearing from them about how they feel about it and what they think was really also important. Do you all have any resources that we can share on court watching or any any resources that you might recommend um, that we can share with the group? There was a question about this. And if not, we, we're happy to come back to it and see what we can find. But uh, there, there sort of is an art and skill to court watching and figuring that out. But if there's anything that you can share about that, let me know. 
I think, I think Massachusetts has a, and I'll see if I can find the link, Priya, and put it in the chat, but Massachusetts has a whole manual on court watching, and we've taken that and adapted it to what we're going to be doing here with Fides and Fees Justice Center across the state. I'll see if I can find that and put it in the chat. I don't know if I have anything for court watching, but one thing that uh, I do want to remind people, a lot of places like Nevada and here in Texas, um, judges are elected officials should find when those elections are go to their events they usually have an email somewhere for their campaigns um, and have these discussions with them and see who is aligned and who is not aligned on these issues that matter to you always a great reminder i think we forget about the elected judges in this process there is a question in here about how did the coalition address concerns from legislators that eliminating warrants would lead to people ignoring their tickets as well as more dangerous driving? That is a concern that we hear repeatedly from legislators when we're discuss discussing the idea of eliminating warrants. Number one question, every single time, <laughs> like every single time. So, um, you know, you have Lisa come in, like explain it to people, but the data, the data is just so important. I think sometimes people don't realize, I don't know, and just reminding people that most people are good and they want to do the right thing. And I may be an eternal like optimist and see the best in people. And sometimes it's hard, especially with social media and like this constant bombardment. But I think reminding people that people are generally good and want to pay their bills and are law abiding people. And the idea that everyone's a criminal until proven otherwise is just a, a crazy, it's craziness. So I think having that data, showing people that, you know, attaching fines and fees to, um, you know, money doesn't keep you safe. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't keep you safe. It doesn't protect you from anything. Um, and most people don't even know it's a criminal thing. They don't realize they could be arrested. They don't realize they have a criminal misdemeanor on their record for, you know, a broken Daylight. That's a good point. The data was what we were able to use to show because we got those questions from legislators and they were referred to as scoff laws. What do we do about the scoff laws that just don't want to pay? And so what we were able to show them is a few things. We showed them Carson City. We didn't have to go outside of our state for an example of how this was working, a system that had implemented a court that had implemented a system like we were asking for and how it was working. We also showed them data from other states. So Texas, Dallas and Fort Worth. Fort Worth um, is, was still using warrants and Dallas was, no, Dallas was using warrants. I think Fort Worth, Fort Worth was not. Um, Priya will correct me on that one. But the one that was not issuing warrants was collecting a dollar three, I believe more than the, the jurisdiction that was issuing warrants. And so we were able to show Dallas, uh, Texas, we were able to show California, we were able to show our, our very own Carson City. So having those examples for those legislators, because legislators, you know, they are about the bottom line is what I've learned. They're about the bottom line. How is this gonna work? How is this gonna affect us? And how is this gonna affect our, our bottom line? So showing them examples of where this was working and what this looked like in other places and what it could look like for us here if we implemented the system was key. And, and I'll add real quick, um, there's, a, there's a slight difference that we saw between the driver's license suspension uh, and the warrants, right? The warrants, um, the argument was, oh, are people gonna pay? How are we gonna collect this money? This is our safety. Um, we With the driver's license, we all, suspension, we often heard, um, well, we're getting unsafe drivers off the road by suspending their license. Uh, that was a, a, a major argument uh, against us ending driver's license suspension. And what we were able to educate uh, people on was the simple fact that most people who were getting their driver's license suspended for really all of them who had failure to pay was not a safety issue. It was simply they were unable to pay their fines and fees. And what happens in a state like Nevada, where we have very poor public transportation, is that somebody is now in debt without a driver's license. They have to drive to get to their work. If they ever are going to get out of that debt in hopes of getting their driver's license back, there's a good chance they're driving. And if they're driving on a suspended license, that means they're driving uninsured, which is much more dangerous than having somebody driving with outstanding debt. And we also had to make it very clear that we weren't ending the point system on the driver's license. If you are getting a DUI or driving reckless or you get caught speeding seven times and get enough points to have your driver's license suspended, 
right? If there's a clear indication that you are a risky driver, there's still an ability to suspend that license. But if you don't pay a parking ticket, there's no reason that we should take away your ability to make money. And it was hard to get that message through, but we were successful in doing so. No, that's great. There's, there's another question in here. So it says, in Florida, we face a challenge where leadership, largely conservative, is unmoved and not listening to stories of personal impact on individuals. They figure that criminals get what they deserve and don't want, it's in quotes, by the way, <laughs> and don't want to hear anecdotes. Any suggestions on how to gain support among legislators using fiscal benefits or system efficiencies that might resonate with the conservative audiences? And Marcus, I am going to kick it to you because yeah. I know this is a large part of, of how you all frame the work, but at least start with you. Um, I think the fiscal part does play a significant role in showing um, how much more money you are able to get if people have an opportunity to comply and you're not putting people locking up. It is the extreme drain on the system, on taxpayer dollars. If you have to lock someone up, you have to go uh, then put them in front of a judge. It is a whole process, um, which I believe in most cases, if you look at the data, will show you're not making back what you're spending for this entire process to lock someone up. And that is on top of the economic um, decrease that you're going to see output wise on the state its economy as a whole um, so that is one of the key things to hit the second thing is we always talk about second chances right if you've you know paid your debt to society you should have the opportunity uh, to continue to live on and we use that across all of our criminal justice issues uh, to begin with but conservatives I uh, there's sometimes you know kind of they focus in on just the minute, worst of the worst. And we saw that on this, people would just say, oh, that very tiny, tiny majority. Um, but they, it, there's a tendency to ignore the great benefit for the millions of other people who are just there because they don't have an alternative method to pay. Um, and you need to be able to explain what those other options are. Uh, I have great faith in Florida. I'm originally from Florida that we they can be able to adjust this hopefully in the next 10 years. Um, but this is something that we're going to deal here in Texas as well. I mean, there's 601 cities in Texas that are still using this omni-based system. Um, and hopefully we're going to be able to show that, this, that between the 200 cities that no longer use this, um, that the data shows that it is an ineffective system and in the long run, we're saving money on taxpayers. I think also getting one of the things that I found very effective was um, if you can get a jurisdiction or you can get a local jurisdiction to kind of monetize the cost of like arresting someone on a warrant. So we always put it, we put it, I put it as this as an example when I was talking to people. Um, you get a speeding ticket and um, the speeding ticket, the fine is $150 and you, uh, you don't have the money to pay the $150. So it goes into a warrant and there's a warrant fee of another $150. So now it's $300 and you're in a criminal warrant. So now you have two misdemeanors, a failure to pay as well as the original speeding ticket of one to five over. Um, you get pulled over. That police officer now has to um, pull you over and can't just write you a ticket or give you another ticket or like what they have to do at that point is they now have to arrest you. So they have to call someone to impound your vehicle. Your vehicle gets towed. So now you have another $250 like tow fee that you're going to have to be accountable for. Um, we had, we tried to get the officers and the sheriff's departments to monetize the amount of time it took from uh, for that police officer to arrest that person, take them down to the station, book them into like custody. And then we found on average, people were serving 72 hours in custody on that traffic warrant. So that same one to five speeding ticket that started off as $150. Now, not only are we paying for an hour of a police officer's time to bring them down to the station and impound, like, you know, impound their stuff, take their, you know, mugshot, take their fingerprints, get them through like, you know, health screening and booking, book them into jail for 72 hours, feed them, put them in there. They're probably losing their job now that they've been in for 72 hours. 
Um, so I think also engaging employers like chambers, um, other people saying, hey, this is a way that we can keep you having employees, especially since we have like an employee shortage. This is a perfect example to say, here's a direct economic impact to like small businesses and businesses, um, you know, and then now they're released. Um, sometimes they would give credit for time served for that initial ticket because now they've been in jail. Um, but how much how many court resources like um, the court clerks that have to input the warrants into the system, the sheriff's department that now has to like look into the records to find out if that traffic warrant is in the system. So I think finding ways to monetize all of the time that goes into that single traffic warrant for that one person um, is a good way to show that the data, there's no way it can't save everyone money. Like there's just no way. <laughs> Also with that, we were we talked with some law enforcement officers who were supportive and talk and as Rochelle said, monetizing it, we were able to get some salary amounts from them. So we were able to show that when an officer pulls someone over for a warrant, as Rochelle said, they have to tow their car, they have to transport them, they have to book them. So we were able to get some numbers as far as officer salary and what that costs the actual state in the county to the officers. We and we talked about, we showed them that what it was costing to house this person, as Rochelle said, average 72 hours and giving them credit for time served. So we, we were able to show them that you're actually losing money when you use the system of warrants, arresting people, transporting them, housing them in jail, you're actually losing money. So we were able to show that you're taking money out of the state coffers, you're not actually making any money. I think that was also very, very impactful too. And then Rochelle also mentioned the deputies in warrants. We were, Sheriff in uh, Carson City said, look, our deputies have to take hours to verify these warrants every month. It's taking time away from our officers being out on the streets and actually arresting people for more serious crime. And so having those numbers and talking to people who are supportive of this and being able to show that this is actually losing us money would be very impactful if you're trying to do this work. It's really, really great point because we know when we do the fines and fees work and we have these conversations around the country, people are only looking at the, the spreadsheet, right? Like what is the dollar amount for the fee and potentially how much are we bringing in or not even always what they're bringing in, but mostly what they're assessing. And there is an entirely sort of like dark hole of there are costs. There are a lot of tangible costs that really go into this number. And it's going to be, while not impossible, likely almost impossible for it to ever economically truly make sense, right? And then when you add in the harms and the, the economic impacts to a community and the losses in the community and, and all of the sort of other layers of where economic losses then sort of uh, spiral, mm -hmm. it's never financially sound to make these types of decisions, right? The harms right. outweigh any financial benefit you're going to get. Um, and the way you have done it sort of systematically and thought through that, even if you can get it in one jurisdiction is a really great example because it's hard to get this information and really do it. Um, that can sort of be expanded that if this makes, if this is the case in this place, it's clearly the case everywhere else, right? That's doing the same thing. Um, so that's a great, it's a great point. If I can also add something, um, if you truly have a law and order individual, you have to illustrate the trade-off that now this lower level offense is taking the priority of an officer that can respond to a higher order offense, a murder, a robbery, whatever it might be, uh, as well as if you truly care about effective policing, you need to reduce the interactions where you have negative uh, negative. Uh, to negative impacts on the trust the community has with the police officers. So if you truly believe in law and order, you need to support uh, outcomes that promote trust that we know that the community and the law enforcement officer uh, can trust one another to be able to report because effective community policing is based just on that. I think one of the things that was also effective with law enforcement and getting them to be comfortable is explaining that a civil burden is a lot 
easier to prove, honestly, than a criminal burden. Um, you know, when you treat a traffic, a speeding ticket like a criminal matter, they're entitled to, a person's entitled to, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. They're entitled to all those constitutional privileges when you are, you know, when your liberty is at like, you know, a risk. And so um, one of the things that we really incorporated and looked at in other jurisdictions is when you reduce that burden from beyond a reasonable doubt down to preponderance of, an ev of evidence, um, you didn't have to have police officers coming in for misdemeanor trials any longer. Um, um, you know, they didn't have to, get, again, get off the street and, um, you know, dealing with real like crime um, to come in and testify. So in addition to impounding someone, bringing them down, booking them, you know, you also had the whole scenario where now the whole entire court process also, they don't have to come into court to testify at a misdemeanor trial for speeding one to 10 over. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I found really interesting, and this is this is something we've seen in other jurisdictions that are, where the state has gone a direction after a local jurisdiction itself started to do some things in the space, right? And so how much do you think, so when advocates are thinking about strategies, right? Like we have to also think about the long-term and how, how are we gonna get to what we're trying to get? Is there, because you've mentioned a few times some value into thinking about what can some local jurisdictions that might be a little more ready, a little more willing to do certain things in their authority in some of these spaces on the local level, if we can get them going, and then how that can feed into a statewide push to get the rest of the state on board. And how, how much do you think that that helped in, in what you all tried to do? Okay, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> you know, I can I can just say it was I think it was it was extremely helpful. But again, because not only did they implement it, they were able to show that this system was actually working. It was they had the support of law enforcement. It was freeing up law enforcement law enforcement officers to actually go out and police and arrest for, you know, more serious crime. It was their collection rate went up. And I think that was one of the most important aspects because like I said, bottom line is important for most jurisdictions. And so when we were able to show that their collection rate went up, um, that was also very helpful. And how do you talk to a local jurisdiction and maybe get someone on board with that? You know, We were fortunate, we found Carson City who had already been doing this, but Carson's, we were able to connect Carson City with some other courts and, and talk to them. And so even I believe one of the a court in another state may have even been talking to our folks in Carson City. So there were conversations about that. And so if you can find, you know, local jurisdictions who might be interested in this, but I think it would be would need to be supported by data, showing them, you know, look, this is what you've assessed, this is what you've collected, and you know, perhaps you would be able to increase your collection rate or something like that. Being able to show them how that would benefit them. And honestly, like I said, we found Carson City who had already been doing this. I don't know how you would start that, but I think um, just maybe talking, calling those jurisdictions, some smaller ones, and maybe seeing if they would be willing to do a pilot program. I believe there are some jurisdictions around the country that may be doing pilot programs. So this is where communication, I think Marcos mentioned communication earlier. This is where that's important and reaching out like for us on this webinar and reaching out to other um, organizations that are trying to do this work and may have some of those relationships just talking about it in the beginning and seeing okay what do we have to work with and how do we use this for something bigger and and i'll add this when it comes to finding like these local jurisdictions that that might be doing interesting work um it's important to look where you might not always think right uh, carson city being a prime example but for example as we as we look at misdemeanors uh, in a broader context in some of these crimes uh, at like the assembly woman mentioned, such as feeding pigeons or misuse of a park bench or blocking a sidewalk, like things that criminalize homelessness. Um, you know, we look, our more progressive centers tend to actually have some of the most egregious laws on the books, uh, like our biggest cities. But what we have found, uh, similar to what Carson City did, is there are jurisdictions that are of a decent size, such as Fernley, who don't actually have any municipal codes on the books. They're running straight off of the state. And so we have examples where 
may, you know, if we can show that they don't have a higher level of crime, uh, they aren't actually like enforcing all these tiny municipal, like many micromanagement of everyday human behavior. Uh, but you find it in a place that we wouldn't normally look. So, you know, looking at these smaller jurisdictions in your states and working, you may find that um, some of these, and it may be out of necessity due to uh, budgets, budgetary, uh, you know, strapness, but uh, you may find that you have some unique examples of people doing what we would consider is right and actually showing good success with it, just like in Carson City. Yeah, and so this is a good plug for our, so we have a cities and counties for fine and feed justice project where we're recruiting cohorts of cities and local jurisdictions that want to do some of this work. Um, and we'll be having a, a boot camp web, well, a webinar next week about sort of the boot camp and what's to come. So if any of you all are interested in thinking about that type of strategy on the local level in your jurisdictions and working with your local governments to do that. Um, I really encourage folks to attend that webinar and see what might be possible to start getting that movement maybe on the local level to help shape some of the state work. So I have a question here um, because some of the provisions of um, this legislation don't go into effect into 2023. There's a question here that says, has there been any progress for getting jurisdictions to implement the remaining provisions beforehand before the actual uh, 2023 date? I know that I continue to meet with the different jurisdictions, especially the ones that are like, I guess, more close to me. Um, and I agree with what Nick had said. Sometimes the more egregious things are in the bigger cities. <laughs> so I think um, I have been like meeting with them, reminding them that they don't have to wait. <laughs> until 2023 to start implementing these things. Um, so I think there is, um, you know, part of the reason I think we were able to pass um, AB 116 also was because we did give a lot of leniency on implementation date. And part of the reason that we did have that long implementation date was, I, I mean, I would it would be stupid for me not to recognize that I we did ask them to change their entire system from a criminal system to a civil system. So I think that was significant and um, that it, it's amazing. It, it's everything from how the tickets print out to reprogramming computer things to um, some jurisdictions still have like carbon paper tickets that they give out to people that have like criminal information on it and criminal citation numbers. So, um, you know, just like some of those like seemingly simple like things. Um, I think we were also aware that we were asking for a pretty significant like, you know, systematic change to the system um, in the middle of like a, a pandemic. And so I'm hopeful and I've encouraged people to look and see if there are ways to implement and use some of those ARPA funds to be able to update and modernize their systems like that are in place. Um, um, so I'm hopeful that some people will get on it sooner, but um, yeah, um, I would ask the people to reach out to those individual jurisdictions to see how that's moving along. We've, as Fines and Fees Justice Center, we've met with some of the district attorneys around the state and just to find out, we have a district attorneys association uh, and I think Rochelle mentioned John Jones and we met with him pretty much right after the legislative session ended to say, okay, what are the district attorneys around the state? What are the courts thinking? And we've been asking them, I know the Assemblywoman's been asking, we've been asking them to go ahead, you know, there's no reason why you can't implement this system now. And so what I learned is that there are some of our rural jurisdictions who have already decided they're going to go ahead and begin using a civil system. I don't know exactly how many, or which ones those are. That information came to me from some of our district attorneys. They're like, look, it's happening. We're just going to go ahead and do this. So we're just talking with people and also helping them to understand what what this legislation means for them. I talked with um, some sheriff, the sheriff here in Clark County, our Metro Police Department. There was so much confusion there, Rochelle. You would just have been amazed at how much confusion there was. And I went to one of their meetings and just helped clarify what some of the confusion for them. And so just having those conversations and being available and 
I've also reached out to people to jurisdictions. They say, hey, how are you doing with this? What are you thinking? And so it's been a lot of work um, after the fact, just reaching out to all of these different jurisdictions, law enforcement agencies, district attorneys, um, court administrators, and saying, what are you all thinking? And how can we help you implement this system? And we're still doing that. And I think we'll be doing that uh, you know, until, it actually, until people actually get it going. So this has all really been, I think, really helpful of laying out, you know, how did you use the data, the framework? How did you talk about this? How did you build coalitions and have been building sort of coalitions of people over what seems like oh, at least a decade to, to start chipping away at these issues? And, and you've made, you know, you made great strides this, this year, um, but there's still more to do. I know the work is not, I know for sure because of FFJC is, is staying in place. So, but the work here is really just getting going in, in a lot of these spaces. So, you know, we touched on how this particular um, decrim approach was about traffic, right? So there, there, most states have, have moved that way, although we need them all to sort of go in this direction. But there's a larger conversation here too, which is one, decriminalization alone doesn't change our fines and fees system, right? It, it moves it into the civil system, um, which helps greatly with and significantly with collateral consequences that attach when you are in the criminal system. So there's not a, you know, I don't want to water down the significance of when you decriminalize something. The second part of this question is also, what are we, enforcing in general, right? So you have this second conversation about there, and I think, uh, Rochelle, you mentioned this, the, the pigeons with the feeding the pigeons uh, rule or law in, in your state, which is like really stems to a larger question of like, even if that is a great example, like if you move that to the, the to a civil system, isn't the real question is what should be existing in these spaces to begin with, right? What should be civil? What should be in so decriminalized and what should not exist at all <laughs> in these spaces where it doesn't give the opportunity to jurisdictions to one and use it in the criminal space as an enforcement uh, mechanism that causes a lot of problems, but also doesn't move it to a civil space that could incentivize even more fines and fees, right? And could, could potentially use it even more um, efficiently in generating revenue and, and especially under harsh economic times. And so where, where are you all thinking about what's next on um, your agenda for the fines and fees work and how, how you also wanna build like the work that you've done here really how is what you're building on to do these next things. So um, I'll start with you, Lisa, but I, I wanna hear sort of everyone. And I know Marcos, you're in Texas now, but you may wanna give us our, where are you going in Texas? I don't mind that approach too, <laughs> so. You know, so many, so many things, so many places to go and building on this work. And I know um, talking with Assemblywoman Wynn, I, I, I remember the last day of session and she and I were talking and she said, I'm already thinking about cleanup language for this bill. I mean, there were so many things that we wanted to include in there. We want to eliminate fees for community service. We want to expand the definition of what community, what satisfies community service requirements when someone is going through a payment plan or want to, wants to do, needs to do community service in lieu of monetary sanctions. So we certainly want to work with her to do some cleanup language. But, you know, we are very passionate here at Fines and Fees Justice Center in Nevada with the, the system of misdemeanors and understanding this vast system of misdemeanors. And it is huge. It has so many different components, so many systems within the system. And so one of the things that we're doing is just looking at that entire system, the fines and fees that goes with that. And as you mentioned, Priya, what in that system can be decriminalized and what can be legalized. And I mean, it's so huge. There's all of these different jurisdictions, these different cities, they have their own municipal codes. They have counties have their own county ordinances. And much of those things are misdemeanors and the revenue that's attached to that is huge. And so we're looking to build on our successes and start working to dismantle some of the misdemeanor systems where we can. Nick and I are talking with law enforcement officers across the state because there are so many of them that are saying, look, some of this stuff just shouldn't be. We don't want to, we don't have time to enforce it. It takes our officers off the street, patrolling streets for more serious crime and puts them on things like arresting 
people, homeless people. Trespassing is a huge one. And so we're just looking at the system, getting as much data from all of the jurisdictions across Nevada to find out what they're issuing citations for, what people are being arrested for, all of these things. We're looking at what are what is the amount of fines and fees that are associated. And it's, it's huge. It's a lot of work. So we're hoping to just begin to make a dent in, in that system. And I can add to that since we're working together on it. Um, when, when, when we're really looking at this, uh, as Priya mentioned, there is there's a, there's a big difference between decriminalization and, and legalization, just getting something off of the books. And, and one thing that we need to be careful about is, is if as we approach misdemeanor reform um, in these low level uh, crimes, if we do move something into civil, it's important to ensure that a lot of the, that the criminal fees that are associated with it as a misdemeanor do not follow it into the civil. So there is like the general assessment fee, right? Which can add hundreds of dollars to a ticket, right? Um, if that fee is to remain in existence, it should not follow these crimes that become small civil penalties. So should so that that's one thing. Two is we do need to have the tough uh, conversations about legalization, um, about decrim, about completely getting off the books laws that criminalize things like homelessness, such as misuse of a park bench. I do not believe I can misuse a park bench. I think I could be on it for two days without anybody saying anything, but uh, it is a law. So we need to have those serious conversations about that. And I also think we need to look towards Colorado, who recently ran um, set a uh, sentencing reform task force, where they went through uh, in a coalition every misdemeanor uh, in their revised statutes and they purged the books of many of them. They combined many of them and they lowered many of them as well as put their fines and fees into a more manageable structure. Um, I don't know that they achieved perfect bliss. I don't know that that ever happens in these types of things, but I do see a great example of a neighboring state who has really started to address this. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from them. And I think it's something we should start to look at here in Nevada. For me, I mean, now I'm in Texas now, but uh, continuing this work, I'm looking forward to partnering up with you guys and everyone here uh, in, in Texas to work on this omnibus system. Um, if, if anyone on this call listening is uh, in Texas, do not hesitate to reach out. We're going to be engaged in this very hard. We're in 11 different markets in Texas. And uh, right now, our strategy is to join in uh, with partners at CEOs for Racial Equity and a few others uh, to convince these municipalities to let their contract with the omnibus system to expire. So here in Texas, uh, it's actually local governments that are contracting out this work to this private company that holds the system. This is multi-million dollar drains on budgets. Um, and as uh, Lisa mentioned, I mean, this, the research shows that they're collecting less money compared to cities that they do not use the system anymore. Um, and right now we're starting to see a pushback from this company. Uh, they're uh, putting all this fear mongering out there. So that's definitely something that we're gonna be pushing back against. Um, but we are in a very unique moment for fines and fees in general. Uh, in 2019, the Supreme Court said that the Eighth Amendment and excessive fines applies to states now. I think in the next 10 to 15 years, there's gonna be a, a whole slew of things to look at um, of, of what exactly we're doing with fines and fees and the associated things, whether it be civil asset forfeiture, um, and you know, how do we fund our judicial systems at the end of the day? If we don't fix that perverse incentive, this is going to continue. Uh, and my you know, pessimistic libertarian side is always gonna think that government's gonna wanna get more money out of people any way it can. Uh, but one thing that we can totally negate is judicial system. That is a core function of government that needs to be funded from general funds entirely. It should not be relying on staffing on excessive fees to the fines we've already issued out. That is a perverse system, um, which is also a plug of sometimes we need to look at the tax basis. What are we doing in a tax reform? How can we tie this all together? Because we need to make sure that the judicial branches, law enforcement, it's all getting coming out of the general fund, not from almost shakedowns of people in normal life. I think that there's just so many things to do. I think about, you know, this bill, I think about even the implications of like, you know, moving 
criminal things into a civil collection thing. I'm sure there are things that I'm going to have to now address about collection agencies and fees and fines that they associate with those private companies that are, you know, collecting those fines and fees. Um, but I, I think what, you know, what I'm always looking at when I'm ever I'm looking at any kind of policy or policy changes, like, do, does the current system, does it, does this fine or this fee, is it fixing the problem? Like is criminalizing and putting someone it, that's feeding pigeons outside of like a park is that is that fixing that problem like is one is it a problem two um if there is a problem is that fixing it probably not and me paying as a taxpayer for someone to be in custody for anywhere from in this case it was 72 hours but anywhere up to six months for that type of charge i think those are things that i'm constantly looking at um i know i remember we had an assembly judiciary bill in 2019 um, that eliminated, and it passed, thankfully, um, but it was super impactful. It eliminated fines and fees that we were imposing on juveniles. So like a, a 15 year old with a truancy, like, you know, or, you know, smoking weed, we were implementing like a hundred dollar fine on that person or a fee or an administrative cost. And so, you know, I think passing that law and finding those other areas where we're like implementing fees on children and adults <laughs> for that matter, I think is really important. So I think there's lots of room for improvement in our system. And I'm thankful that you all on this panel are there to, you know, keep uh, legislators and local officials, you know, um, keep them on their toes and remind them we can fix this. So, you know, as we're thinking about where we go from here, right? Building on the work. Um, things are also changing in real time right now, right? And so I've had a lot of conversations with advocates across the country and as they're strategizing about their next legislative sessions, um, that there is also a, a big narrative going on right now about uh, public safety, increase in homicides and in, in, in dangerous violent crimes. And so like we're starting to now see again um, the fear mongering and getting everyone really scared about interactions with people in the criminal justice system. And, you know, there, there is a very, I think, legitimate concern about backsliding as legislatures move uh, forward in these systems. And for the Fines and Fees Justice Center, this work has always been uniquely in, I think, our perspective position, right, in that it's an economic justice issue, it's a racial justice issue that is embedded inside of the criminal legal system. And I truly believe especially this work can't like move well and aggressively during the time where this other narrative is, you know, hopefully beaten back in and we're able to deal with it, but it, it will be harder for folks who are trying to do other types of reform to combat that in a way that I think this issue right now can still move forward because we are still dealing with the economic implications of COVID-19, right? What is the, you know, we're, we're, people are experiencing different economies right now. We have like a great economy and an awful economy sort of happening in their, in the same lived experiences of people right now. We have um, all kinds of things that are going on where th this issue of how do we financially punish people for act actions and all the collateral consequences that come with it. And actually how does spending, you've all touched on this, that time on those things actually take away from law enforcement's ability and the court's ability to give like we have tons of plea deals, we have tons of ways that the, the criminal legal system is used because it's become so monstrous, right? To scale it back, to actually focus on the things that might have ties directly to public safety, and then we can be more intentional about how we use our criminal legal system, where and when it's appropriate, actually make it rehabilitative because as Marco said, most people are coming back out. So if we can actually create a system where it's used far less and then the, and knowing people will re-enter, but making them more whole and capable and situated in order to return, like that is a system that looks very different than the one that we have now. So how do you all think about this work, this economic justice, racial justice work as it sits in this? And are you concerned about anything sort of moving into these legislative sessions or things that people should just 
keep on the forefront of their minds as they're thinking about their strategies and, and what to push with the fact that, you know, all these things were sort of also unfolding in real time. And I, think, I oh, go ahead, Rochelle. Yeah, great. I, I think just my quick answer is if you have a strong nonpartisan, bipartisan, you know, coalition working on the legislation, I think that can also help. I think I think AB 116 here passed like overwhelmingly. I think there was only maybe one or two people that didn't vote for it. Um, so I think that is a strong statement on, you know, the policy moving forward. So I think finding that, um, you know, I happen to be the right sponsor right now. And I know it's sometimes hard to take ego out of people's like <laughs> sponsorship of bills, especially in politics. But, um, you know, you know, if it was a different situation, I would definitely say, hey, this needs to be brought by someone of the other party that can be the champion for this cause. Um, so and it shouldn't be super problematic because you will have a broad if you start early, you will have that broad coalition of support. That's not just left. It's not just right. It's not just social justice and law and order, but it's also labor and it's also, you know, um, you know, bureaucrats and it's also, you know, um, trucking people. It's like it's so I think that the broader the coalition that you can have that engages in the process and really engages, not just signs their self on a letter, but also, you know, is a part of like putting together the legislation that will make, you know, legislation like this more attractive. And, and what I'll say briefly, um, you know, that was beautifully put, but I like to always say that the work that I do, the work that the people I work with do, this is for public safety. We want safe and prosperous communities. And one thing we know is that the more economically stable a community is, the safer that community becomes. And if we can ensure that our communities maintain the resources and have the ability to get to work and have all the opportunities that they can be afforded, those communities are gonna inherently get safer on their own. It is going to free up law enforcement because there's always gonna be some crime. But what we are doing is in the interest of public safety. Uh, it is through an economic justice lens. It is through a racial justice lens. But at the end of the day, we are working together to build strong communities so that we do not need as much police presence and as much courts and as many people in the jails and the prisons. And also, oh, I'm sorry, Marcos, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that. I mean, um, that is one of my biggest concerns right now is, you know, if the economic indicators continue to get worse, we know that's going to lead to more crime because people still need to eat. People still need um, basic necessities of life. They need to pay rent. Things are still going on in life, uh, which is extremely important uh, that you know, we have a prosperous economy where everyone's able to achieve success and not be held back, which is one of the reasons we got into criminal justice, right? America's for prosperity. Our thing is we're for prosperity. And when we have a criminal justice system that holds people back from being able to achieve that prosperity, it has negative consequences for our country as a whole. Um, and, and the second thing is, you know, don't get, don't get off message. Um, we always say, you know, we want to be smart on crime and soft on taxpayers. Uh, I think that perfectly encompasses this, and it's important to have the right message. Sometimes I think um, some of our allies have said things like defund the police, which doesn't really work the right way because it doesn't get across what we're really trying to achieve, which is reinvest money in ways that are going to have positive outcomes for everyone. And what I wanted to say is much of what my colleagues on the panel have said, we know that there's a correlation, strong correlation between poverty and crime. And looking at this work through that racial justice lens, economic justice lens, and making it so, removing those barriers to where people can find jobs, people can go to work, and taking away their these barriers, misdemeanors on the record that often keep them unhoused, keep them unemployed. And those, that not only makes communities safer, but it also enhances people's mental health. I mean, we talk so much in this work about making communities safer and making communities healthier. 
And we have to think about what that actually looks like and how this work that we're doing with criminal justice reform helps all of those things. I mean, if you think about someone asked a question in the Q&A about I, the fact that I mentioned that I was arrested. I was arrested um, several years ago. It's been a long time, but I had my kids in the car. And it was because there was an outstanding warrant, one I didn't know about. Um, it was in a something happens here in Nevada. We have this thing where we have county and we have city. And so I had a few tickets. One was in the county. I went to the municipal court and paid, got on a payment plan for all of them, not knowing that one of them was in the justice court, which was a whole different system. And so I'm driving along and I don't, I'm dropping my kids off at school. I don't pull all the way over to the curb when my kids did get out. School police saw me and pulls me over and arrests me and takes me to jail. And that that really happened. And so thinking about it from that perspective of a mom, a single mom or a parent who has an outstanding warrant and they do know it and the stress that that causes when they see a police officer, they pass by, they're afraid that that police officer might turn around and get behind them. Or we know that communities, black communities, Latino communities are over police. You know, so doing this work and thinking about all of those different things and how we can not only make communities safer, but we can make those communities healthier. We can make it so that people are able to get employment. We can make it so that people are able to to get their kids to school safely. We can make it so that people don't have the stress of wondering, of uh, being afraid when they see the police behind them or seeing the police, am I going to get pulled over? So all of these things are components in this work that we do. I just wanted to point that out. I don't know where that came from, but I felt like I should say that. You should, and thank you for sharing. Um, and I think it's a really, it's a really important point too, right? Because we know for a fact that the, the a lot of the policing issues are, are stemming from a broken, there is no trust in these, in these communities, nor has this trust been earned, right? So the, the lack of trust is not, you know, it's deserved in many places that the, the police and the community, the police are not serving the community, right? They've come in in, in ways that are policing them. They are not making, it's not about public safety, right? And so I used to work at the Office of, of Community-Oriented Policing and what it means to do true community policing, be in your neighborhoods, know the people in your neighborhoods, know, you know, the grandma next door and the kids down the street and know the, the like who's, you know, who's possibly getting into some things that we want to help and get into after school programs. That's really community policing is knowing your community. And what we've been doing is just revenue policing, right? How do we cite people? How do we get more people into the system? How do we, you know, make this whole thing work? And, and it only works if there's a lot of people coming through. It's only profitable for companies to work in this space. A lot of people are coming through. And so really shifting all of that is, is a key part of this, um, all of this work. So we have uh, just two minutes left, and I want to first say thank you to everyone on the panel. I think that this has been really helpful to hear how the work uh, unfolded in Nevada, where you're going next, how you're doing it, how you're building coalitions. Some of the things I really took from this um, is that this issue is, you know, not even bipartisan. It's nonpartisan. It's just good for our communities, it's good for our uh, state and local communities, it's good for our states, it's good for everybody. If we start shifting away from these really um, oppressive policies, abusive policies, and, and all these ones that create barriers uh, for folks to prosper. And, and that's really what everyone wants to do. We, it's easier for us to categorize folks as bad. And you know, like the bad things happen because they're bad people. But the truth is, everyone wants to prosper. Nobody comes into this world not wanting to succeed, but there's a lot of things that happen between that point and all the other points that keep us from that prosperity. And it looks different for everybody. And that's something we have to recognize is that just because we don't experience that barrier doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so part of this coalition building is also to understand that our lived experience is not the only experience out there. It is just one of many ways that people are living in this world. And so the better policies come from those collaborations. So thank you all for sharing. Folks um, can reach out. We will make sure 
people are, especially FFJC's team, Marcos is available for um, follow-up specific questions and, and just be more collaborative on this work across the country because we're all doing the same work. And so knowing about what's happening where and who uh, helps us all do it better. So thank you all for your time and um, for being with us here today. And we look forward to doing more of these and just really uplifting the work around the country. So thank you so much. Bye, take care. <laughs>